There are two ways that today's psalm could be really hitting you wrong. The first is probably an American problem more than any other, and that is the boredom that we find with repetition. So when we're saying one line and then repeat, and one line and then repeat, and one line and then repeat, we've somehow as a culture managed to train ourselves to lose meaning. In fact, I've even heard it said that the reason we shouldn't have the Lord's Supper every week in church is because then it would lose meaning. As if by doing something too many times, you could strip it of its truth. And that's doubly weird when you think about the Lord's Supper, because the Lord's Supper really isn't about how you feel that it means. Whether you feel it means anything or not, Jesus in flesh and blood is joining with you physically. And if you think that loses meaning because it happens too often... Well, I don't know if you're really doing the math quite right on that one. But to say again and again that his steadfast love endures forever, well, by the time we get to the end of it, my guess is you, like me, weren't really paying much attention to that line anymore. So that's the first way we can go astray. The second way that we can go astray is the other lines all speak about how God is the author of creation and how great and marvelous the works of the, the created order are, the sun, the moon, the stars, the wind, the waves, the mountains, the sky, all these amazing things. And it would be very easy to fall into a common, what we would call deistic, God-fearing, fair enough, uh, mentality which thinks that the reason that we praise God, the reason that we love God is because of how great and big and marvelous he is. In fact, if you go into one of those many churches that have abandoned Lutheran hymnody and replaced it with more uh, frivolous, more recent songs, you'll find that most of those songs are about how great and how big and how marvelous God is because he made stuff. Well, sure, he made stuff. But both the psalm and then our gospel reading today think that the making of stuff, the, the giantness of God, that's actually not a reason to be happy at all. That's a reason to be afraid of Him. Why would you praise something that's so big that you're but an ant, a, a, pige, a, a smidgen, a, a peon beside Him? What on earth could compel you to think such a, a ter terrifying monstrosity is good? Unless, in fact, there's some other thing that... in that tells you, that promises you, that makes it clear that he is good. So on the one hand, you have God making all these things, but then you have it counter. It fought back against that reality, the fact that his steadfast love endures forever. So you have the, well, you don't want to be bored with that truth, nor do you want to think that the bigness is what is good. The bigness is what is real, and the truth with which we too easily get bored is that God's love is greater than his bigness. That his mercy for you is greater than his power to do whatever he desires. And this is doubly true if you know that that word we translate steadfast love in the ESV is a very unique, very special Hebrew word. I don't know much Hebrew, honestly, but this word you should know. Keseth. See if you can say that in your head. Keseth. K-E-S-S-E-T-H. And we don't have a word in English for keset. We can't do it. We would need sentences, unyielding, steadfast, loving, merciful commitment with total fidelity forever and ever because he is eternal in one three-letter, actually, word in Hebrew, keset. So we give it the phrase steadfast love, and that's fine. It works if we think about what love really is, commitment. And we think about steadfastness, something that never moves. But I'm afraid that in English, steadfast love just doesn't really inspire us much, does it? It's kind of a weak phrase. Keseth, his unyielding fidelity to you endures forever, past all these other things which he has made. And that is what the disciples of Jesus learned somewhat the hard way, well, throughout Mark's gospel, but we see it particularly in chapter 6 today. This follows right on the heels of what happened last week. If you were at this church, you heard it preached on, right? At this service, I should say, you heard it preached on that Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves of bread and two fish. A stunning, astonishing, impossible feat. 
We talked back then about how if you have trouble with evolution or you have trouble with the flood, which we heard a little bit about today as well, how can you not have trouble with the feeding of 5,000? It is one of the most audacious things I've ever heard, that they got more bread left over than when they started. Well, that's what happened last week. Immediately after this, as soon as he has fed the people, Jesus tells his 12 apostles to get onto the boat, which they had come across the water on in the first place, and head back the other way. Goodness knows what they thought, how he planned to get up and catch up with them again. I, I have no idea why they even did what he said. They'd be like, you got to come with us. We're going to walk around the, uh, the lake. It's a huge lake. Even so, they go across the water, and then he gets what he was after in the first place. Do you remember this? The start of last week's text pointed out that he was so overwhelmed by people asking him to heal them that he could not even eat. Right? They weren't even able to have dinner. Well, now he's had dinner, I'm sure. They ate some of the bread. And this crowds are being dismissed, it's nighttime, the disciples are gone, and he's going to get some introvert time. And it's not just about being an introvert. What is he going to do with this alone time? He's going to pray. Now, Jesus and prayer is a topic which we could probably spend an hour on just in its own right. Because for Jesus, prayer is a little bit different than it is for you and me. Yeah, uh, Given the fact that he knows everything. And in his conversation with God, which for us is a one-way street, prayer goes up, it doesn't come down. But for Jesus, given that he knows all things and can understand the scriptures perfectly, and us actually as angels respond to him, things like that, prayer goes both ways. So hard to reckon with that one in a, in a smidgen, in a pinch. So we're just going to kind of leave it there. He goes, he prays. What we should see in this is that he needs consolation as a man. Uh, he needs comfort as a man. He needs to let go of his attempt as a man to do what he wants. Now, as God, he has no problem with this. But as a man, he's, he's got the flesh just like you and me. Right? He, he is a human. He needs comfort. And so, as a good, perfect man, he releases his cares. And what cares would he have? Well, while he's going about preaching and teaching... Everybody wants more bread. Everybody wants more miracles. Nobody wants to listen to him preach about the cross. And we're going to see this a little bit as a hat tip, as the disciples still don't even get that he's God. They don't understand who he is. But that is then what we are to take from this text, the gospel reading today, two things which the psalm already told us. One, that God is all-powerful and Jesus is God. And two, that in spite of our lack of understanding of any of that, he is for you and not against you. So he's up on the mountain praying, evening comes, and the boat is out to sea. The Sea of Galilee, I said lake earlier, it is massive. It is, it is kind of Great Lake style big, right? So he can see it out there across the waters. And it's, it's a place where it's location off of the Mediterranean Sea. Let's see if I do this backwards. You've got Italy and Greece here, right? Did I do that? Yeah, that's right. The Mediterranean Sea is here with Turkey coming down here, and then Judea would be down in this region. The way that the weather cycle would work is storms would come across the Mediterranean Sea and then head down south right over Israel and over the Sea of Galilee. And so they would get these things that the best we can compare them to in the United States is like a northeaster. If you know anything about Northeasters, when they come out of the Arctic and just wallop the, the northeast coast of the United States and the shipping that goes up there and what challenges that, that has. If you ever watched a movie or read a book called The Perfect Storm, you can kind of think what I'm talking about. Now, that's on the ocean. This is in a lake, a very large lake, a sea. But even so, it got rough from time to time on this water. And the boats that they had were not what we would kind of be comfortable with today. They're, they're really big canoes, big enough for 10 guys, but not really able to handle waves in any serious way. In either case, this isn't like the worst storm they've ever seen, but it's enough that they can't go anywhere. They're stuck in the middle of the water. They can't get off the water. And he sees this from afar. And what's really interesting as the wind is against them, is that he decides, there's so much interesting, there's so much bizarre. In the middle of the night now, late in the evening, he lets them suffer. Late in the evening, he decides to go out, but he doesn't go out to help them. He goes out to go past them and to let them suffer. Now, it'd be really easy to say that that's what this text is all about. It's all about how in the storms of your life, 
right? You've heard it this way before. God allows bad things to happen, the storms and the waves to be there, but then when you put your faith in him, he'll calm the storm, is usually the way the story goes, something like that. But it's, if we're going to allegorize it, which is what that is, you take a story and you say it's not about the story, it's about another thing. If we're going to do that here, what's it about? It's about how God has no intention of making life easy for you. He intends to simply let things go on as they have from the beginning with all the storms and the clouds and the problems and, and let you just deal with it. While he takes care of the thing you actually need most, which has nothing to do with stopping the waves. It has everything to do with dying on a cross for your salvation. That's his intent, to let them well, deal with it, to let them suffer. And he's going to pass by them, which, again, it's just marvelous indeed. They, they see him out there, though, on the water, and they think that he's a ghost. Now, this is not the kind of ghost that you would think of when we, we think of the, the TV shows, uh, Ghost Hunters, or whatever the most recent one on Discovery Channel is. This isn't sort of Casper the Friendly Ghost either. For the Hebrew, even though they believed in the Old Testament scriptures, they were quite a spiritually mythological people. That is, they believed in supernatural things in nature. And so they believed that demons would actually live in nature. Like, say, out where the jackals are in the desert. That's the haunt of demons. That was one of the places. And they also believed this about the sea. That the sea was the abode of the underworld, right? And Greek mythology picks up on this. A number of mythologies in the world pick up on this. But when they cry out, it's a ghost, they're not saying, like, this is a former dead person. Yeah? What they're saying is there's a demonic spirit being out here upon the waters from the realm which, of darkness from which it came, and he's here to harm us or destroy us. That's who they think Jesus is when they see him in the midst of the storm. Now, isn't that interesting as well? That those who know him best, even when they, are, they, they, they have walked with him and talked with him and had him teach... Uh, when they are in the midst of trial, they cannot perceive him. They cannot understand him. They are confused by him. They see him as somebody else. And this is where I think, if you're going to take anything from the sermon today, the, the Alleluia verse already has picked up on it for you. The most important phrase in the entire text is, when they see a confusion, which they think is a demon, but is actually the Almighty God who made the wind and the waves and the stars and all these things, walking past them and ignoring them, but they're afraid of him, he calls out to them the most comforting words I could ever imagine hearing. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. That is what God in Jesus always says to you. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. That no matter what you see in this world, no matter what you feel in this world, no matter what you experience, the man who died on the cross, as God, did so that you might have heart. That is, be consoled. That is, in your fear, have an antidote to the fear. And that antidote is that God who made all things is Jesus on the cross. And because God who made all things is Jesus on the cross, there is, there is nothing for you to fear. Now, are you going to fear? Yeah, of course you're going to fear. But it is all childish fear. It is all fear which God is bigger than. And in the cross of Jesus, in Jesus on the cross, in his flesh and blood, all that is overcome and defeated and taken care of. Not for the sake of tomorrow, but for the sake of the last day. For the sake of eternity, it is done. And that is not exactly what he says to them then, but it is. As he calls out to them, you have nothing to fear on this boat from me, because I am God for you. This man who has confused them time and again throughout Mark's gospel, remember Mark's gospel, Jesus is a dark figure. He's an odd figure. Why did he send them across the water and leave them for this to suffer there? In spite of all of that, when he speaks... He gives grace and mercy to them. When he speaks, he demonstrates his keseth, his steadfast love, his unyielding commitment to them. There is nothing for you to fear. 
And he got into the boat with them. And indeed, when Jesus is present fully, when he comes again on the last day, the storms are going to cease. All the trials will pass away. The doubt, the fear, the confusion, it will all be gone. Because the world which is in chaos without him will now have him as its heart and center. And indeed, that is already the case in that he has ascended to heaven and is reigning it all. But he's ascended to heaven reigning over it all like a man on a mountain watching you and a ship go across the sea. Now for the disciples I cannot say, but for you I can. You have more than they do. You have the full knowledge of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so as the trials come, you have an answer. That even though your boat is not going to get to the other side of this sea, Jesus is going to come in a late watch of the night, saying, rise up saying you have nothing to fear, and puts you into a new world, a new heavens and earth, where there is nothing to fear ever again. They are confused themselves. The wind ceases, and they're just astounded. They, they can't fathom it. You would think they would be like, oh yeah, Jesus, he's God. <laughs> but they just don't have it yet. And this shows you the hardness of man's heart. In general, the fact that you believe is not a reason to pat yourself on the back. It's a miracle in its own right, right? Man resists the truth of Jesus. They did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Man is hardened against the gospel. I find it interesting how often or how possible it is to use the best things that God gives us for ourselves, for our own ambitions or strength. Some of you may have seen me this morning speaking with a gentleman outside on the street. Uh, he was here when some of those who came early to open up opened up, and wonderful, they spoke with him. God bless you for that. Uh, he was in tears, and he was praying. He had a car. He's homeless, though. He lives in his car. He has a job. I had a lot of trouble getting all the information I needed out of him on this because he's, he's making money, but he can't afford a home. He's weeping. He's talking about people who are not good for him. He has a tattoo of Jesus ascended on his forearm. It's clouds underneath Jesus, right? So what is this? Right? And in the 10 minutes I was able to speak with him, I tried to tell him about the promise of God for him. Because he kept trying to tell me about his attempts to get right. How he's tried to get right, and he's tried to get right, and how he can't get right. And I tried to tell him, you don't need to make promises to God. God is in the business of making promises to you. Now, why do I bring this up now? Because after all of that, after the rejection of what I said, not in, a, in an angry way, just he just couldn't hear it. He couldn't hear that there was an answer outside of him, right? His heart was hardened to that. After all of that, I said to him, come in, sit down. I don't, no one else preaches like I do, I said. And he said, no, not this week. I'll be back next week. Now, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. If, if he comes back, his name is Curtis. Say hey to him by name and pull him in. Say, hi, Curtis, glad to have you. And he is a unique man if he comes back again next week. But I, dem I bring this up to demonstrate the confusion of the hardness of man's heart. He just couldn't hear what I was saying. And that's our sinful condition. That's way worse than drugs and alcohol or prostitutes. The worst thing about us is that the word of God comes to us and we are either confused or bored by it. Like the song from where we started, yeah? Confused or bored by it. The disciples were such... And so are we in our flesh. The miracle is that you are not in your faith. We'll try to wrap up quickly here with the, the remainder of the text. They cross over and they land at Gennesaret, the other side of the lake. They get out and there it all begins again. The crowds, football stadium-sized crowds, run to him. And they're bringing all the sick people and they're laying them everywhere, wherever he goes, and they just want to touch his cloak so that he might be healed. They might be healed. Again, if you've got trouble with evolution, then you don't want to believe this either, if you're honest with yourself, right? 
Uh, if you got trouble with miracles, there is no miracle like a man's cloak having healing powers. It's close to the stupidest thing I could tell you is true, if it's not true, historically speaking. So that's going on, and this is why the crowds are coming. How is Jesus drawing these crowds, if not by this? Why do they crucify him as a sorcerer, if not for this? But what I want you to get out of this closing piece is just one little bit again. That as tired as he is, as little as anybody understands him, as wrong-headed as the requests for healing are, They should be asking for faith in his death and resurrection. He heals them anyway. He does the same thing he did for the apostles in the boat. Take heart. It is I. You have nothing to fear. Yes, you don't understand, but I understand, and I am going to take care of it for you. All of this happens on the shore of Gennesaret. If you, st- uh, if you hang around a Lutheran church long enough, eventually you're going to sing a hymn. I don't even remember which hymn it is. But the last line of like verse 2 or 3 always confused me as a young man. It's asking for blessings, and it says, As by Gennesaret's shore. Well, this text is what that hymn is talking about. So if you ever run against it again, you're like, Oh, maybe I can remember now. As when Jesus, after calming all storms and feeding 5,000 people, continued to give gifts and blessings to people who didn't understand or appreciate it. That's what we're praying that he would continue to do when we sing that hymn. The fact of the matter is that as many as his words touch will be made well through faith in them. And that, if you take anything from me today, again, you take these two things. God is very big. He's able to calm every single storm there ever was with a snap of his fingers. But that doesn't matter nearly so much as the fact that he is for you and not against you. And so rather than handle the things you think are dangerous, he's handled the thing he thinks is dangerous, your sin, by crucifying it in himself on the cross. So that when you come in and remember your baptism, and when you come to the table, you are given bread and wine, which is the promise, take heart, it is I, there is nothing to fear. In the name of Jesus, amen.